we uh, will talk a little bit about the structure of the event. We're going to start with some event uh, questions that I've uh, selected in consultation with the panelists. Um, and then uh, we also are welcoming, would love to see questions from you guys as well in the chat. Um, so please, uh, please post any questions you might have in the chat and we will try to get those um, in the uh, rough order that they are uh, presented to us. Um, you are certainly welcome to ask multiple questions, but we do ask that, um, or we will prioritize answering one question per participant, and then you know, if, um, at, we exhaust the pool of questions. Um, that we'll certainly take multiple questions at that point. But I do want to make sure we do. We certainly will make sure that everybody has an opportunity uh, to uh, to speak. Um, and also, uh, please uh, be courteous and civil to each other in the chat window. Uh, bear in mind all the uh, standard stuff about um, expectations for student conduct, et cetera. Um, so, um, so some of the questions we'll be talking about today are uh, the significance of something that happened earlier this week, crossover day, uh, budgetary questions about the uh, this uh, current fiscal year, uh, which is the 2023 fiscal year, and then the, the upcoming fiscal year that will start in July 2024, uh, as well as some of the key issues that have been before the legislature uh, and uh, involved in state politics more generally lately, including certainly key questions like health care, um, housing affordability, and safe housing and things like that, uh, education, um, the issue of uh, the uh, proposed splitting of Atlanta into a separate uh, uh, entity, perhaps known as Buckhead City. Um, and then also uh, sports betting, gambling has also been on the agenda as well. Um, and also some uh, broader questions about uh, politics and government in, uh, in Georgia and nationwide may come up as well. So, um, Without uh, too much further ado, um, I will uh, make this uh, slide show disappear um, and we will uh, uh, proceed to our uh, our questions if the uh, assuming both of our panelists are ready. Um, so um, <clears throat> let's see. So let me move my thing over so I can don't look like I'm looking. Away from the screen. Um, so, uh, so we'll start off with our first question. Um, so I mentioned uh, in our uh, uh, introduction that one of the things that happened earlier this week on Monday was something called crossover day uh, um, in the General Assembly. Um, so what is uh, what is crossover day and uh, why is it important in the work of the Georgia State Legislature or the Georgia General Assembly? Great question, Chris. Um, I will jump on this one and leave the budget to uh, Julie in a minute. Uh, welcome all students. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Julie, for being here. Thank you, uh, Dr. B for joining us and other uh, faculty. Um, welcome to our second policy discussion of the semester. Uh, to kick things off again, great question. What is crossover day? Uh, to understand crossover day, we need to look at a few details of the Georgia legislature or the General Assembly. Uh, constitutionally, the Georgia legislature has 40 days uh, to get through its entire uh, agenda. The number one most important thing that the Georgia legislature must do, that all legislatures must do, is pass a budget. In addition to that, there's other legislation that's introduced. A little over the halfway point, uh, day 28, I believe, um, we have what's called crossover day. And crossover day, quite simply, it's like a cutoff. Uh, if you've introduced legislation into the Georgia House of Representatives, if it has not passed the House of Representatives by the end of crossover day, it's fundamentally dead. And the same thing goes for the Senate. Um, Monday was crossover day. Now, there are a few legislative tricks that can be used to bring something back to life. But in general, if your legislation hasn't passed at least one chamber of the state legislature by the end of crossover day, it is effectively dead. And it is a huge rush uh, on that day. There were over 200 bills uh, before the Senate, over 100 before the House. And those that successfully passed at least one chamber will go on to live another day and try to get passed in the other chamber. And if then, of course, off to the governor. Um, on that note, I will hand it over to Julie if she wants to add anything to that. I, this is something of a unique legislative reality in uh, Georgia that not all states share. Uh, but again, it's an interesting cutoff point a little over halfway through. I think that was an excellent 
um, explanation and description. And as you mentioned, even if a bill doesn't cross over between the chambers, there are still ways to get it through, most commonly through language as an amendment to a bill that does survive crossover day. Um, so there's a couple of things to watch. Uh, if you do follow politics in Georgia, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution actually earlier today, they said sports betting might not necessarily be dead. There may be a way they're going to try to work some of it into another bill So because it actually has a lot of sponsors. Um, another thing um, that to point out about the state legislature and it's 40 days right now, March 29th is scheduled to be signy die, which is the last day. So it's going to be a flurry of activity over the next couple of weeks. So those of you that are interested in following, I encourage you to um, tune in, Atlanta Journal Constitution, Georgia Public Broadcasting, um, great resources as we wrap up the session here in the next few weeks. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, that's one way in which, you know, state politics differs a lot from national politics in that, um, you know, at the federal level, you know, the, the Congress meets for a two year session. Um, it does have adjournments and things like that, but there's no real institution like crossover day or uh, a specific, you know, drop dead deadline, uh, you know, in law. It's just one of those things that, you know, as you get closer and closer to the end of a two year congressional session, your bill is more, less and less likely to pass. Um, but it's not quite the same thing as, you know, a lot of states like Georgia, for example, do with the crossover day. There are some states that don't do that. There are some states that, um, you know, have longer uh, terms. Uh, there are some states where the state legislature only meets every other year. So, um, you know, one of the neat things about state politics in general is, you know, just the variation between the states and Georgia's, I would say somewhere in the middle in terms of what might call professionalization of the legislature. And it, it's got some um, some things where it looks a lot like what what sometimes referred to as a citizen legislature. Um, you know, it's a legislature that meets, you know, for a brief period of time and is part time and doesn't really do all that much, um, relatively speaking. Um, but it also has some characteristics of a. Uh, um, some of the larger states that have, you know, more professional legislatures like California and New York, for example, are two of the states that usually uh, political scientists identify as the most professionalized legislatures. And, you know, as as Georgia's become a larger state, it's become a quote unquote more professionalized state in some ways, but not professionalized in others. Um, and one of the ways perhaps when we're not professionalized is, you know, that short uh, 40 day session, uh, which uh, does, um, which again, has, as Bo, Bo, Julie sort of alluded to, ha, has this kind of interesting factor as well, that it kind of, it starts out very slow and it kind of builds up pace until it's like, you know, become like a sprint at the end. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks are kind of sleepy and then it, it, you know, suddenly people go, oh yeah, there's a deadline. It's kind of like, well, I guess it's kind of like, um, you know, an assignment in college or something, right? It's like, okay, well, you know, I, yeah, you know, this paper's due three months from now, and now it's due two months from now, and now it's due one month from now. And I was like, oh, one month from now is only four weeks, so maybe I need to start working on it, right? Um, so it's uh, the the deadlines sort of concentrate the mind in the legislature uh, as we uh, move through the next few weeks into, uh, you know, as Julie was saying, is a uh, sign of die is uh, right around the corner, really, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, so, um, so as uh, uh, Dr. Hall alluded to, um, uh, we uh, our first kind of substantive question is about uh, the budget, um, or actually two budgets, technically speaking. Uh, we have the supplemental budget or amended budget uh, for uh, the uh, current fiscal year, uh, so the 2022-2023 fiscal year, um, which um, you know we're currently in. Um, uh, which is kind of a common practice in state legislatures to go back and kind of uh, backfill the the budget, adjust it for realities that weren't quite anticipated when the legislature met last year. Um, and then uh, we also have the budget for the upcoming year uh, as well. And so two important pieces of legislation, there are literally billions of dollars at stake. Um, you know, what are some of the key highlights of, of both of those budgets that are going to be relevant to, you know, our audience and the state as a whole. Um, I'll take that one. Um, good explanation there, Dr. Lawrence, um, of the, the budget, the amended fiscal year budget. 
for 2023, as he mentioned, um, because when they make the budget, they don't know what the tax collections are going to be necessarily for the next year. So they have to make those adjustments. Um, as we know, too, the state has a pretty large surplus of cash sitting around. So that opens some doors fiscally that we might not have seen in previous years. Um, so it's important to note, though, that while we have this nice surplus sitting around and uh, we're seeing some nice bonuses from that surplus. Um, if you watch economists and budget um, staff and they're just kind of saying, hey, you know, maybe we need to be a little bit of aware that the, the forecast for future years could show a decline in revenue. So that's also on their mind as they're they're balancing uh, spending and and um, these programs. So uh, just a few highlights. Um, the amended fiscal year 2023 has actually been passed um, earlier this week. Um, I don't believe the Governor Kemp has signed it yet, but it was passed on Monday. Just a few highlights I thought you all might be interested in. Um, a one-time tax credit was proposed. Uh, it was up to $250 or $500, depending on your filing status and if you filed. Um, previously, some of us received that um, last year, that bonus, um, so that's kind of uh, a, a nice surprise for a lot of people to help during these economic times. Also, approximately $1 billion will be allocated to property tax relief. Uh, the average is expected to be approximately $500 per homeowner. So that may be something that also helps homeowners um, during this time. Also, to approximately $1.1 billion will be allocated to GDOT, the Georgia Department of Transportation. I don't know if you remember last year, whenever we were not paying the state tax on gasoline, um, while that helped us in our wallets for our families, that took money away from GDOT to fund highway construction, maintenance on our roads and our infrastructure. So to help make up for that lost revenue, they want to refill that account as well. Now, these are all planned to be allocated. There's actually separate legislation that will need to be passed to do all three of these things. But as of right now, last time I looked, it looks like that those programs will most likely be funded. Um, so those are some things to look out from from the amended fiscal year uh, budget. Uh, the fiscal year 2024 budget, uh, an hour ago I looked at the newspaper and it appears that the House did actually pass it. So it'll go on to the Senate for their action. Um, a strong focus in this budget was actually on funding public safety. And there's been a proposal to increase the salary of law enforcement officers by $4,000, uh, provide funding for a GBI cold case office, and approximately $1.25 million to place a Georgia State Patrol satellite station in Buckhead. Um, also, a lot of funding is focused on mental health and substance abuse care, and they'll receive money to not only expand those programs, but also to hire more staff to increase pay. Um, the formula for funding K-12 through education should be fully funded, which in previous years, Whenever economic times were a little bit more difficult, it wasn't. Um, and there's also funding in the budget, um, if it does go through both chambers, to allocate money for students in K through 12 who may receive reduced lunches. Well, it would actually allocate the money that these students wouldn't actually have to pay for their lunches at all. So that's um, something that we're seeing. Um, probably maybe a little more relevant to those of you who are on the Zell Miller Scholarship. Now, Governor Kemp wanted to fund that at 100%. The House budget writers decided, no, we're not We're not going to do that. Um, they are proposing for it to be funded at 95%, and the other 5% will go through, go towards some pre-K programs. And state employees. State employees are scheduled, if this goes through, to receive a $2,000 pay raise. Um, last year, there was a $5,000 pay raise. <laughs> yeah, we're all like, yay. Um, this includes K through 12 teachers, employees in the University System of Georgia, um, and other state agencies. Um, why are they doing this? It's some really, oh, it's just a handout. Well, the realities of government employment, there's a lot of turnover. Um, there's actually about 29% full time agency staff turnover in state government because state government salaries are not always competitive with the private sector. So the hope is that by boosting these salaries that there will be an opportunity to retain and attract talent.
I have very little to add. Great job summarizing that, uh, Julie. The only thing I would jump on in terms of some contemporary politics, uh, Julie mentioned the extraordinary budget surplus that the state of Georgia has, uh, which is a good thing. It's a sign of a strong, robust economy, something of a champagne problem. But the Kevin administration and the legislature is dealing with something of an issue in terms of public opinion, while not a majority, but a strong plurality of Georgians when polled want to use a, a good deal of that budget surplus on infrastructure programs, on education. But there's also a poll for tax rebates that Julie mentioned. So there's a, a slight political uh, fracture there in terms of the government and a plurality of uh, Georgians when polled. But uh, beyond that, uh, I really have very little to add. Right. Yeah, I think the only point I would add is, you know, um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, having money is better than not having money. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, particularly when it comes to the legislature, right? You know, um, they're not having to make tough decisions in a way that they might have had to in previous years or, you know, perhaps down the road. Um, I, I guess the only thing you know, we have to bear in mind is, you know, that, um, uh, you know, that there ought to be some caution to make sure we're not, you know, making commitments that we're going to have to worry about down the road, um, being able to fulfill them, right? Um, which, um, which is where some of that pain does come in when, um, when the, you know, when, when the demands on government are more than the, uh, the money coming in. Um, so speaking of um, an area that uh, involves a lot of budgetary spending, healthcare is one of the huge, uh, one of the largest areas of of government spending in Georgia, um, and uh, you know those have continued to be a focus of interest for the legislature in recent years, trying to figure out exactly how to best deliver care um, to to people. I know mental health has been a big issue. Uh, that uh, the uh, uh, now late uh, Speaker Ralston was uh, quite concerned about. Um, but we've also seen some other issues dealing with healthcare as well, access to rural medicine, and for that matter, access to medicine in uh, urban communities as well, like south, south side of Atlanta has been a big issue lately. Uh, gender affirming care has been an issue in the news. Um, what sort of actions has the legislature taken this year to deal with uh, the healthcare issue? Or issues, plural. John's muted. I have to do that at least once. Um, there are a number of health related uh, issues before the legislature. I'll start off with one that is universally popular. Let's start off with an easy one. And that would be a cap, a proposed cap on the price of insulin. Uh, the legislature is looking at a $35 maximum uh, price that can be charged by pharmaceutical companies for a 30 day supply and a $105 cap on a 90-day supply. This is a policy that has extraordinary bipartisan support. Um, insulin uh, is not necessarily as expensive to make as it, in terms of the price that you might see sometimes. This is a controversial area of a market economy. Is it ethical uh, in the name of profits to charge an exorbitant amount of money for a medicine that is literally going to determine life or death for many Georgians. So that's a fantastically uh, popular uh, policy. It passed the Senate 52 to two, so it had incredible support. Um, some other legislation that is that receives some degree of bipartisan support, um, HB 129, uh, involving pregnant women uh, and making them eligible for temporary assistance for needy families funding. So for any of our students out there that aren't familiar, uh, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, uh, was, a bi was a product of bipartisan support in the 1990s, signed into law by President Clinton that reformed American welfare. And while it is available to families with children, in Georgia it is not available to pregnant women who don't have children. So what the House bill is trying to do is open up availability for pregnant women living in poverty, who do not yet have children. So on the one hand, this is something that is exciting for Democrats and Republicans, particularly the Democratic Party, which would generally champion such a policy. Um, however, the qualifications for this program are quite strict. I believe it's something in the realm of $800 per month. If you make more than that, you would not uh, qualify. It's It has incredibly narrow parameters. The while obviously voting in favor of this policy, uh, many state Democrats are 
basically offering the critique that this is just not enough, that instead of expanding TANF for pregnant women living in poverty who don't already have children, we should go ahead and expand Medicaid. Now, that opens up another huge area of legislation, uh, Medicaid expansion. I was almost about to ask all of the audience if you were aware of it, but I won't be able to hear you. Is everyone in here familiar? I'll just pretend you're saying yes with the Obama administration's signature health care policy, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. I'm going to assume you all said yes. Part of and one of the pillars of the Affordable Care Act was an expansion of Medicaid. Now, if you are at if you're a state that takes part in this because the Supreme Court, while upholding uh, the central tenets of the Affordable Care Act, they said that forcing states to expand their Medicaid was a bridge too far for the federal government. So states had to voluntarily join the Medicaid expansion, uh, which would allow them to provide Medicaid for individuals making up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. Short story even longer, if you are a state that decides to take part in the Medicaid expansion, you are going to dramatically expand the number of your citizens that qualify for Medicaid, and the federal government is going to pay 90% of the additional cost forever. You pay the remaining 10. Georgia is one of 11 other states that has not yet uh, expanded our Medicaid role, and the pressure has been building for several years to do exactly that, mainly because uh, we have, I believe, almost one and a half million Georgians who do not have health insurance. And if we were to expand uh, Medicaid along the Affordable Care Act, there would be about a half a million Georgians who instantaneously would have health care free of charge. Now, this additional money would cost the state of Georgia around $350 million, but we would get back about $3.5 billion from the federal government. So that brings me that long intro uh, to House Bill 226, which is an attempt at expanding Medicaid coverage to low-income people with HIV. Obviously, this had bipartisan support, but again, Democrats wanting to go ahead and just expand Medicaid in the state of Georgia, which has at this point, in terms of a percentage of our population at almost 14 percent, we're basically the third highest state in the republic in terms of uh, the, number, the percentage of citizens who are not covered by any health care plan. On that note, there's so much to get to here. I want to jump over to an incredibly controversial piece of legislation that was up, and that was Senate Bill 140, which was an attempt at banning uh, gender affirming procedures, uh, things like hormone replacement therapy, puberty blockers uh, for the treatment um, in, in minors, and basically limiting the ability of family doctors, medical professionals uh, to prescribe certain drugs for transgender youth. Um, there are a lot of variables at play here. This did pass 33 to 22 on strict partisan lines. Um, basically what Republicans have said, and this was introduced by Senator uh, Summers, Republican from uh, Cordell. I have to admit, I've been in Georgia almost a decade. I have no idea where Cordell is. But uh, this was the author of the legislation. And basically he's saying that he wants to prevent minors in the state of Georgia from taking part or he wants to prevent what he considers irreversible gender reassignment surgeries and procedures for minors who may not, who, who literally lack legal consent. The Democratic Party is pushing back saying that the elevated suicide levels are actually more irreversible than this legislation. So when you look at the data, and there are mountains of data suggesting this, the LGBT community itself, but particularly the transgender community, have uh, significantly higher levels of suicide rates. And we've seen also in the data that when transgender youth have access to gender reaffirming medication and counseling, suicide rates tend to plummet. So that's really where the two parties are on this legislation. Republicans say they want to prevent young people from taking part in irreversible medical procedures. Democrats are countering that with the transgender community has a disturbing level of suicide rates and assistance from medical professionals has been shown to help that. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics itself recommends uh, that doctors provide children with comprehensive gender affirming and developmentally appropriate health care. The medical community is quite united in its desire to provide these services to transgender youth 
Uh, so a lot going on here. We'll see how this fares when it goes over to the house. I've lost track of time. I can't tell if I'm going too long or too short. So one last thing I will jump on is, and actually, no, I'll stop there because if I keep going, it'll be another 20 minutes. Okay, Ricky. Um, Joy, did you have anything to add? Or? No, I think you did a great overview. And like you, you had mentioned, um, the late speaker, Ralston, was very... Um, much in support of expanding mental health care. And there were a couple of bills that have made it through the house to help recruit more workers in, in mental health and also maybe give some student loan forgiveness for, for different types of health care workers. So if those bills pass, that may be applicable to some of our students that are watching um, in the future. So um, I think Dr. Hall did a great job. And just so you know, Cordial is about 60 miles south of Macon on I-75. <laughs> Cardin Summer is my senator. So. Um, Okay, dokie. Um, so um, let's see. So um, another issue that's of course been before the legislature earlier this uh, legislative session uh, was um, uh, the issue of safe and affordable housing, um, particularly in Metro Atlanta, has been a real issue. Um, you know, there have been bills on tenant protection, uh, trying to uh, uh, increase the affordability of housing through overriding you know, local zoning rules and things like that. Um, any updates on the status of uh, that legislation after a crossover day? I'll take that one. Uh, we'll f touch on the tenant protections first. Um, the specific bill is House Bill 404, which did survive. It's called the Safe at Home Act. Um, over the last few months, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution has really been digging in on the issue of affordable housing and safe housing in Georgia. And it's it was on the, the mind of legislators before they started doing this work, but it's really helped bring it to the forefront. So that kind of shows you the importance of journalism and the relationship between their work and what happens in politics and the state legislature. Um, so they actually... Um, had a series uh, called Dangerous Dwellings and where they highlighted several issues related to unsafe rental properties in the Atlanta metro area. And there was actually an interactive list of what they deemed the most dangerous apartment complexes in the metro Atlanta area. Um, so as compared to other states, Georgia's legislation was lagging behind in protections for tenants living in substandard housing. So um, the AJC and other housing advocates really wanted to call this out and actually try to start to do something about this so everybody has a, a safe dwelling. And so I encourage you to, to, to look at that if you're interested in this issue. Again, it's dangerous dwellings. Just Google that Atlanta Journal-Constitution. So House Bill 404, the Safe, Home, Safe at Home Act, was introduced to ensure that rentals are, quote, fit for human habitation. So there can be some different definitions of that. Um, but it has to be fit for human habitation, not just when you go pick up the keys and sign the lease and hand over the check. It has to be through the duration of your lease. So if this is passed, it's also going to place various limitations on landlords, including a limit on security deposit. For example, only two months rent. They can't request like a whole year's worth of rent for a security deposit because that's unreasonable for most people. Um, and also two notification requirements before eviction proceedings would begin. Um, again, to make sure that there's a process, people are informed, they just don't come home and their stuff is sitting on the street. So it actually will expand if it's passed. Uh, and signed by the governor, it will expand tenant pro uh, protections in the state of Georgia, uh, which is very good for our renters. Um, as far as looking at other issues in affordable housing uh, and workplace housing, if you watch the State of the State Address in January, Governor Kemp was touting his economic record and development and job growth in the state, but he said one issue that he's seeing is that he He's in communication with these companies wanting to come to Georgia and bring these jobs to Georgia, but there's no place for their workers to live. And this is something that we're seeing all over the state. Um, and if any of you have been trying to buy real estate lately, some communities have very, very limited stock and very limited stock in what we would call affordable housing. Um, so we're seeing that problem all over the state, but we're really seeing it in rural Georgia. And that's where a lot of this economic development is happening. Um, so he proposed taking money from um, another program and creating this rural workforce 
housing fund, which would be used to build, update, build new houses, update the houses that need to be updated that may have fallen into disrepair, and also to retrofit commercial buildings. Um, as you go downtown in a lot of communities, urban as well as rural, you'll see a lot of vacant commercial space that could potentially be retrofitted into um, affordable housing, like apartments, condos, those types of things. So that's a, that's a program they're working on. A couple of other bills, um, House Bill 514, which did survive crossover day. It's the Housing Regulation Transparency Act, uh, which actually would limit local governments on how long they could impose zoning or permitting moratoriums for single family housing, setting it at 180 days. So what happens, let's try to do a little zoning 101 here <laughs> in about two minutes. So basically if a developer wants to come into a community and um, build a housing subdivision, um, if it's not zoned already for that, they may have to go through uh, a zoning process or uh, application process and hearings through local government to get approval for these projects. So some communities um, are okay, we'll rubber stamp that real quickly. Some other communities kind of want to do some study and make sure that they actually need those houses in their community so they may have moratoriums on this type of development. Um, some communities are actually seeing developers like companies coming in and building these subdivisions to rent these houses out. So they're kind of trying to stop that because they'd rather sell, you know, have people buy them instead of large investment companies rent them out. So there's a lot of concern with local government. And so they put these moratoriums on these projects for a variety of reasons, but they don't, the state legislature don't, doesn't want these moratoriums just to continue for years on end. So they're going to limit it if it survives um, and gets signed by the governor. And then another bill, uh, House Bill 517, which actually did not make it through. But as we mentioned earlier, things can survive through amendments uh, onto other legislation. This was called the Georgia Homeowner Opportunity Act, which would place certain restrictions on the powers of local governments insofar as requiring certain architectural control or design elements on housing um, to not be allowed. Um, the argument for this bill by the supporters is that we don't have affordable housing because local governments are putting too many architectural controls. They're telling you what type of siding you can have on your house, what type of shingles you can have, what type of um, you know color your house can be. So those are architectural control standards. So that's what the supporters of this bill, they said, we don't want local governments to, to be able to do that. You know, Housing is too expensive because local governments are requiring all these different things. Um, so they said it's going to promote affordable housing as contractors would have the ability to have more flexibility in design and materials because we know vinyl siding is going to be less expensive than brick, putting it on a house. Um, so there was a group called the Georgia Coalition for Housing Opportunity, which consisted of the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the Habitat of Humanity for Humanity, the Home Builders Association of Georgia and the Georgia Association of Realtors, which is an interesting coalition <laughs> when you think about it, they actually all spoke in favor of this legislation because they want to promote more affordable housing. But you have your opposition to this legislation. Your two biggest um, leaders in this opposition would be the Georgia Municipal Association, which represents the 537, well, the five, soon to be 538 municipalities in the state of Georgia and the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, which represents the 159 counties in Georgia. So it makes sense that those two groups were leading the charge against this legislation because this legislation is going to take a lot of power away from local governments and regulating how housing looks in their community. And one of the big arguments, if you watch the testimony that was made by the opponents was that the way that it's supposed, this legislation is supposed to promote affordable housing. That's, that's how they're framing it. But if you actually read the legislation, there's nothing in it that would actually show that the contractors, all the money they save by using less expensive materials would be passed on as savings to future home owners people that buy the homes. And also too, another big concern was, think about the geography of Georgia. The building materials on the coast might not be the same building materials that you need to use in Northwest Georgia, because you don't get hurricanes usually in Northwest Georgia, but you do on the coast. So they argue that they don't wanna take away those local decisions because of th things like geography. But that didn't survive crossover day.
Dr. Hall? Thank you. That was so overwhelmingly thorough. I have literally nothing to add. Okie dokie. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lester. Um, so, um, on to another big ticket item for state government, and that is uh, education, always an important area of state government. Um, before I do that, ask that question, I do want to just briefly remind you uh, that we are uh, happy to take your questions in the chat, so feel free to uh, ask questions if you uh, want to do so. You're not obligated to do so. You're not, you know, we're not going to hold you at gunpoint and make you ask questions, but um, we got plenty of questions to to keep us busy, but uh, but nonetheless, if you do have questions, please uh, please do share them in the chat window, and we will we'll, uh, try to get them uh, to our panelists. But um, going back to our uh, next potential question um, on education, uh, an important area of state government, an expensive area of state government. Uh, what are some of the same, uh, What are some of the things uh, that the state legislature has done this session that affect education, uh, both in the uh, K through twelve sphere as well as in higher education. I guess uh, Dr. Hall, if you'd like to take that one. Actually, yeah, another incredible policy area here, education. Uh, I'd like to reiterate what uh, Dr. Lawrence said. I just noticed the chat does not have a single question. I've never seen that before. We can't be the first group that doesn't have a question. So please, if you have any, feel free. Um, with that said, I'll start with a controversial uh, legislation and then get more controversial as I go, I guess. Uh, I'll start with Senate Bill 233. This is a big one. Um, when you look at the issue of school vouchers, it's it's a fascinating uh, policy area because it actually experiences uh, Democratic and Republican Party members who might cross over a bit. Democratic uh, Party or Democratic voters uh, overwhelmingly in favor of public education and funding it. But if you're a Democrat, in an area with a with an underfunded school system, with a failing school system, you're no longer a Democrat or a Republican, you're a parent. And this is an area where you see Democrats actually siding with what's traditionally a Republican uh, policy area, and that is school vouchers. So uh, with that introduction, the state legislature is looking at a potential $6,000 annual voucher uh, that can be given to parents. Uh, if they have children that are in a school system, that's in the bottom 25% of the state of Georgia. The general theory behind school vouchers is this. If you're in a public school system that is failing, uh, that has low test scores, then we give you a voucher that will allow you to go to another school, which basically translates almost all the time into a private school. Um, and this can be a private school that is private for academic reasons or private for religious reasons. So the $6,000 voucher uh, is intended to go to parents with children in failing schools. The It has a good deal of support in the Republican Party, not as much in the Democratic Party. Supporters basically claim uh, that this allows individual families to make decisions for themselves and most importantly, to get their children out of failing public schools. Opponents look at it philosophically from one and only one direction. This is a fundamental abandonment of publicly funded schools. Uh, every nickel that goes to a school voucher is a nickel that does not go uh, to public schools. So philosophically, Democrats generally oppose school vouchers for that very reason. Uh, also, when you look at the reality, the average private school in the state of Georgia runs a little under $12,000 a year. So the $6,000 voucher is not going to pay for the average private school. And there's also concern among Democrats in Atlanta that this money will predominantly go um, to families that can already afford private school. This issue is one that has national significance. This is something that's debated in all the states, um, but Georgia is somewhat unique. We're one of six states that does not have any policy for appropriating extra money uh, to children whose families are affected by poverty. So the voucher proposal here is unique and it will be interesting to see if this does get successfully passed. Moving on from school vouchers, we will go into another area. Um, Senate Bill 88, which it just now occurred to me, I am not entirely sure if this passed crossover. I believe it did, if anyone wants to correct me, but if not, I will go ahead as if it did. Uh, this at least is a possible uh, restriction on public school teachers. Now you might ask, what is Senate Bill 88 trying to restrict teachers from doing? Basically, it's restricting them from talking to uh, students under the age of 16 about issues related to sexual orientation or gender identity without permission from a parent. 
uh, Republicans strongly support this legislation, and they approach it from the perspective that they don't want children to learn about uh, things like uh, gender transitioning without parental notification, uh, while Democrats, again, go back to the data. Um, there are disturbingly high rates of suicide among the LGBTQ community, and we have shown in the data, again, that programs that uh, discuss, that inform uh, members of the LGBTQ community as minors have inc incredible success rates at lowering suicide rates. Uh, beyond that, we'll hit another interesting um, piece of legislation, and that's Senate Bill 154, which is attempting uh, to exempt public school librarians um, from being prosecuted uh, for sharing any materials deemed harmful to children. Uh, public school librarians ha are exempt uh, from prosecution uh, in terms of presenting material to children that may be inappropriate. Uh, this legislation would take that away. Basically, what the concern is, uh, is that material deemed obscene, uh, predominantly by the Republican Party uh, introducing this bill, can get into the hands of children through librarians. Um, usually this involves sexual orientation or gender identity or race. Uh, opponents of this legislation are afraid that librarians who are simply following their district policies uh, will suffer as a result. So several pieces of legislation here that, rep that, that witnesses the legislature getting relatively deep into public education. Um, there are several others that we could discuss. Uh, I will stop there in the interest of time. Julie, if you'd like to add anything. Um. SB 88, uh, for those of you that may follow politics in other states, you may have heard of Florida. They call it the don't say gay bill. That was a basically Georgia's version. I mean, of course, there were differences between Florida's and Georgia's version. It actually got tabled in committee. It didn't make it through out. Um, it was also introduced by the same senator who was introducing the legislation about gender affirming care. Um, Talking about coalitions, this is a very interesting coalition. You had Southern Baptists aligning with advocates for the LGBTQ plus community uh, with their expressing their concerns about this legislation because it would not just apply to, to public schools, but it would also apply to private schools. It could even trickle down to private camps. So um, there was a lot of opposition to this. And as of right now, um, you know, it was tabled, but again, expect it probably to come back up in in future sessions okay great thanks um so um uh, the uh, the gauntlet has been taken up by the uh, uh, uh the chat um we do have a couple of questions uh, now that uh, john has challenged our our chat participants um so um so we have one question uh, from brandon uh, who's asking um uh are there any um uh, legislation. Uh, I'll paraphrase here. Uh, were there any legislation, uh, or was there any legislation proposed uh, dealing with the abortion issue this year? A short and simple one. Unless something has changed uh, that I'm unaware of, the state of Georgia has fallen back on its uh, de facto legislation, which basically is called a heartbeat bill. Uh, heartbeat bills, as the name suggests, uh, prevent abortion. Uh, after a fetal heartbeat is identifiable by medical doctors. Now, heartbeat bills are an interesting, they're an, ex, they're an interesting uh, exploration of nomenclature. It's heartbeat bill, it sounds like it's limiting abortions to, you, can you hear a heartbeat? But what we have to look at is that the vast majority of pregnant women have no idea they're pregnant by the time a fetal heartbeat can be detected. Uh, so heartbeat bills, to me, sometimes when I'm not careful about how I'm talking, I just call them abortion bans. Um, the vast majority of women will never have an abortion in a state that has a heartbeat bill. Um, Julie, if there are any uh, changes there? No, there was some legislation about defining when life begins, and of course, legislation about going back to expand abortion rights, but nothing went anywhere as far as that bill went. So, so yeah, we're, we're de facto to what we were. Now, in several other states, there's... There's some uh, revolutionary, for lack of a better word, uh, abortion laws that are starting to attack um, the uh, medication like the uh, the morning after pill uh, medication that can end uh, the development of a fetus. Uh, we'll see if that uh, passes muster across the republic, but nothing really new to report in Georgia. Great question. 
Okay, great. Um, so we have another question, and we've gotten a third one in the in the meantime. Uh, but our second question uh, comes from uh, Professor Adam Square, um, who was asking if um, we could give an update on the uh, bill that would have uh, removed runoff elections, and what are our thoughts on uh, removing or keeping runoffs or uh, modifying elections more generally speaking, I would imagine. Great question there. I bet I'm going to jump ahead. Um, Julie, I'll lean on you after this because I'm about to basically say I don't know. I'm not aware of current legislation um, removing runoff elections. I do know that the history of Georgia runoff elections are kind of terrifying. Uh, they have a strong foundation in old school disturbing racism that uh, when you have the requirement for runoff elections, it can tend to dilute certain minority votes uh, or voters. So in terms of contemporary legislation to remove them, I am going to turn it over to Julie because I don't know. Um, according to an article in the Atlanta Journal Constitution today, so the General Assembly actually declined to vote on eliminating the runoffs. So they're focusing on some of the other election issues. But I thought this um, data was interesting. They said that 58% uh, of Georgia voters that participated in a poll, um, statewide poll in January actually supported um, getting rid of runoff elections. As you know, Georgia is one of three states that that does that. Um, so as of right now, though, that doesn't look like that's going to get the support it needs to to move on. So. OK, uh, Dr. Beek has his hand up. I, assume, I don't know if that's a question or um, a response to this or what. Yeah, I've got I've got a general question for you folks, if you don't mind. Where would uh, educated commoners, which is all of us except for you political scientists, uh, where would educated commoners find a comprehensive list of this information in such a digestible way that you've given it to us? In other words, you know, where, where do we have to dig around in the tunnels of uh, the, the internet or do we just have to read the Atlanta Journal Constitution or where, where do your go-to sources? Great question, Dr. B. Um, in terms of the, the legislation itself, you can, of course, go to uh, georgia.gov. You can actually read the entire legislation. I am assuming most do not want to do that. Um, I highly recommend our old friend Google search. If you were to uh, search for uh, Georgia legislation 2023 uh, summary, uh, you can get thousands of great articles that will uh, go one by one through the current legislation. Um, you won't find one article that does it all, but yes, uh, Googling a, a summary of the legislation. Other than that, uh, it's always best to just read the legislation itself, but that can sometimes take a lot of time. And it's sounds written. Like, sounds like we need to have panel sessions like this all the time so you guys can do the work for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Joey, did you want to add anything? Or? No, I, like I said, I, we have to rely a lot on journalism um, just to break it down into common sense language. During the legislative session, every night when they meet, they don't meet on Fridays on the floor, but when they meet Monday through Thursday, when there's a floor session, sometimes there's some special episodes. I believe it's seven o'clock on your GPB station. There's a show called Lawmakers. And so they started out and they, talk about kind of what happened that day and they break it down and they invite representatives and senators and other uh, parties to come and um, speak on what happened on that legislative day. It's also available online, just Google GPB lawmakers. And it's really issue dependent. For example, like as I was doing my research here for this, um, if you really want a lot of these bills, like for example, bills that are important to municipalities, Georgia Municipal Association actually has a legislative roundup and it gives plain common sense language. The ACCG for legislate, they each week they do a legislative roundup on legislation that will affect counties. So kind of think about maybe what your interest is and you'll probably find an affinity group for it. Um, also, I always get their name a little bit messed up here. Uh, find my notes. Um, about the budget it's the was a georgia policy budget gbpi is what it is dot org and that's if you want i mean it it digs deep i mean real deep but there's also briefs that are very common sense too if you want to understand budget issues and 
um, how other legislative issues will have an impact on the budget. Um, also, too, like I said, you go to the state legislature website and you click on their calendar every day. It'll show you and it'll take you a link to the text uh, of the bill. And I actually also encourage people to watch the committee hearings because that's where you'll hear the common sense language. So if there's a bill that you are interested in, watch the committee hearings, either live, recorded. It's all there online and you can actually watch the legislative session when they're on the floor and they're they're getting more and more high tech. You can actually like put both floor sessions on your screen at the same time and follow what they're doing in real time and watch the votes pop up. So there's a lot of different opportunities. Awesome. Thank you, folks. And just to uh, you know, kind of add to what Julie and John were saying, um, you know, I think the the primary resources I rely on, um, you know, the Atlanta Journal Constitution. We've talked about them uh, multiple times already. Not just as sort of a source of some of the reporting that's led to some of the legislation, but also they have reporters that are, um, you know, daily down at the uh, the General Assembly reporting on things. And of course, uh, a lot of their reporters are going to be appearing on lawmakers and things like that fairly regularly. Um, Georgia Public Broadcasting. Um, so. Um, you know, you definitely have the, their website. You could also listen to GPB on your local GPB affiliate, um, WABE, which is the Atlanta Public Radio um, that's separate from GPB. Um, also, I think has uh, some uh, legislative coverage. Um, and also, this is also a good point to plug the possibility of getting involved yourself. Um, not so much perhaps for the um, people my age in the room, but for the students in the room, um, you know, every year the General Assembly um, relies a lot on um, short term employees, both part time and full time. And uh, there are a lot of session employees that they they hire. And, um, you know, that could be a job for a recent graduate. But also people with uh, that are still in college, they hire people just uh, they're still in college uh, for a lot of these jobs in doing things like helping with the broadcasting of these sessions and things like that, the streaming, uh, the social media. And that's uh, aside from the uh, internship program as well. So they also have a formalized internship program that um, brings in uh, juniors and seniors. You get college credit. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in learning more about the legislature, really diving deep in the legislature and uh, perhaps even working in, in state government, um, you know, this is a great gateway to that is, you know, the either an internship or or a session employee, you know, on the Hill, uh, you know, the compensation isn't all that great. But the understanding I have and from my discussions with people up at um, the, the Capitol is that, um, you know, this is a, if, if this is a career you think you'd be interested in, um, this is a great way to get on the ground floor that a lot of people that were former interns or former session employees, um, you know, when there is an opening for a staffer, when there is an opening for somebody to work full time, um, you know, that experience is what they're looking for. Um, and the connections you'll build, the networking, the, you know, knowing the uh, you know, the senators and the representatives is, you know, a huge leg up in doing that. Of course, the caveat to that is you've got to go and live in Atlanta or at least commute up to Atlanta. And that can be a bit of a challenge, um, probably less of a challenge for us in Macon and, and than in some other areas. But um, um, something definitely consider. Um, but certainly in terms of uh, uh, also, keeping track of the legislature, I think, you know, as Dr. Lesher said, you know, keep up with affinity groups. Um, you know, all these groups have lobbyists that are trying to keep track of what the uh, the legislature is going to do to their industry or their their part of the economy. Right. You know, the, there's that old joke from um, I, I think it was Macon who said that, you know, no man's life, liberty or property are safe when the legislature is in session. Um, and so anybody that is concerned about their life, liberty, or property uh, has somebody paying attention to what the legislature is doing um, as a result of that. Um, and so, um, so yeah, GPB, um, that sort of thing, uh, definitely worth uh, um, paying some attention to. Um, I, I did realize that we didn't quite, we didn't answer the question about, uh, uh, or uh, Professor Adam Square's kind of latter <laughs> question about, you know, the thoughts about keeping her eliminating runoffs um you know i think that you know um you know that that's there's a lot of debate about what 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 the merits of that are um uh, as john said um you know originally when runoffs were put in place certainly some of the intent of that was to uh dilute minority votes um there's no question of that 
Um, that said, um, you know, there there have been times when the runoff has been to the advantage of black voters or minority voters. You know, you look at, um, you know, what happened back uh, with the uh, 2000. Uh, 20 election, uh, had it been a plurality, plurality winner election for the Senate, um, you know, um, uh, Senator Perdue would have been reelected, um, you know, because he had more votes, I believe, than um, than Senator Ossoff did going into the runoff. But Ossoff was able to, you know, make up that difference, uh, you know, after the after the runoff. Um, so, um, and so there are some arguments for, you know, um, you know, some people of our, uh, a lot of the, the question I think come boils down to, and this kind of the bigger picture educational thing is, you know, most people, 58% of, of Georgians don't like runoffs, but the problem is that it, you have to replace it with something else and that something else may not have that majority support. You know, um, because some people want a plurality, right? Some people want to just say, okay, well, whoever gets most votes wins. Some people want to say, well, we'll have a runoff if there's if nobody gets 45% of the vote. Well, those aren't the same thing, right? You've got to get <laughs> you've got to have a solution to replace the existing solution, right? You can't uh, you can't just sort of say we're gonna get rid of runoffs and that's it, right? You've got to have a replacement for runoffs, right? Um, you know, right choice voting. A lot of people have argued that that's a good idea, but some people argue that it would make things more complicated. It would make it harder for voters to vote. Certainly, there have been some evidence that um, you know it might slow things down a little bit because you know people just it takes longer to you know say okay, well this is my first choice and this is my second choice and this is my third choice as opposed to simply saying well you know. I'll vote for this person, or and it introduces ambiguities. You know, issues of, well, what if somebody just only votes for one of the three candidates? How do you count that if there's a runoff? That sort of thing. So, um, the bottom line is, you know, I, I don't know that. Um, while I think most people would argue, I think a lot of people on both sides of that would argue that you know the runoffs have um, uh, become increasingly expensive with very little benefit. Uh, um, again, that per, that question of what do you replace them with that sa that satisfies the majority is is kind of the key, uh, key question there. Um, let's see, we've got one question. Uh, is there a legal process for a citizen of another country to join either the armed forces? Uh, yes, there is. Um, talk to a military recruiter. Um, I will save the uh, panelists from having to answer that one. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can uh, if you're. I believe as long as you are legally present in the U.S., they can you can uh, sign up to join the uh, the Army, the Air Force, or uh, Navy, or whatever. Just meet your local military recruiter um, over at the Macon Mall. I believe is where they're headquartered here in Macon. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so I haven't had a chance to read through this full question yet. So let me. Uh, uh so getting back to uh, i guess this gets back to the um uh education question discussion about the quote unquote don't say gay bill and that sort of thing um you know what michael asks you know uh, i'll try to summarize his question fairly here um isn't it reasonable to keep explicit content out of schools and keeping schools about science and writing skills um and, uh, you know, it's, uh, he says, it seems to me that uh, teachers have no business discussing my kid's sexuality with them, and it should be their job as a parent. Um, yeah, thoughts on that, Dr. Hall? That's an interesting question. Um, first, to break that down, let's look at the, the, the role of public education. Um, is sexuality important? Um, is sexual education important? And just in life? And the answer is, of course, absolutely. Uh, and also we have a mountain of data. Uh, there are two general ways of looking at sex education programs in general in public school. You have, well, sex education that will teach um, primary or secondary uh, students uh, the realities of sexuality and reproduction. And you have abstinence only programs that simply teach don't ever have sex until you get married. It's not even close. Abstinence only programs uh, have a much higher rate of teenage pregnancy than uh, schools that have uh, sexual education programs. So from the perspective of public education, this is another area of information that human beings need to have access to. So 
in the same way that we teach about the horrors of the Holocaust on a chapter in high school on World War II. I mean, think about the, the unimaginable evil that occurred in the Holocaust, and we are perfectly fine, as we should be, teaching that to children. I question what the big deal about sexual education is when you think of the level of violence we're comfortable teaching our children. Why not sex education? In addition to that, when it comes to the LGBT community, we've said this several times tonight, they have a disproportionate uh, suicide rates than the rest of the population. So if you have a public school kid in primary, generally maybe secondary education, that is trying to figure themselves out, trying to understand how who they are and how they are and the life they're going to have. If they are having confusion related to an issue that an adult public school teacher is informed of, and they're having confusion in an area that could literally lead to such a feeling of disconnection from the rest of their community that they take their own lives. I would argue that I would definitely see the advantage of erring on the side of knowledge. So when, in, it's a great question, by the way, when you look at it bro broken down, and I've heard this question a lot, what the hell are public school teachers doing talking about, you know, sex and gay people and transgender? It's an important part of life. It's a reality. It's something that we need to know, and public educators have a responsibility to educate. Uh, also, when it comes down to it, there are fewer LGBTQ community members who kill themselves when they have access to resources that help inform them about the realities of their sexual orientation. It literally saves the lives of children to offer resources. So again, another reason to maybe err on the side of public educators Educate. I'll stop there because I can keep going. Want anything, Dr. Lester, or just move on? No, that's good. I think we can move on. Um, so I don't know if we want to answer more questions or move on to our final two questions we talked about. Uh, let's see. So we do have a couple more uh, questions from the chat. Um, so one question about. Um, uh, this is from uh, Aubriana. Um, this is actually a question about Florida, so I don't know if anybody wants to uh, get too deep in the weeds on it. But uh, how do you all feel about Disney and how now having to pay taxes in Florida um, prior to that bill being denied? I'm not sure that's exactly what the deal is with the uh, the Reedy Creek issue in Florida. I mean, we could try to go into that a little bit if you like. Um, uh, we um, might be a little bit speculating. I don't know. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Hall, are you uh, somewhat familiar with what? Yeah, I want to kick things off here with uh, by saying that I'm not entirely sure what's happening and I'm still looking into it. I know there's a degree of self-government that Disney has enjoyed for decades that the DeSantis administration is has taken away. Beyond that, I really can't speak intelligently about it. So I'll stop. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I, I will take off my moderator hat and try to answer this one the best as I can as far as I understand um, from my ridiculously geeky knowledge of one thing's Disney and two things local government in Florida because um, I spent a lot of time in Florida growing up so I, I guess I probably know more about Florida politics and Florida local government than I should. Um, so the long story, right? Uh, you know, once upon a time when uh, when Disney was going to build Disney World, right? Um, and they ended up getting the swamp land outside of Orlando. Um, they got the state government to give them the authority to establish what's called a community improvement district. Um, so basically, Florida allows for a type of local government called a community improvement district um, that is kind of like a city or county government but um but is has its own private um board essentially that's elected by the landowners it's a very simplified version of it so uh if any of you are familiar with the villages um it is essentially established under the same sort of structure so a lot of retirement communities in florida have are basically based around these uh, community improvement districts. And uh, and so what happens is that the landowners you know, elect a board that then um, governs 
a lot of the municipal services and things like that. So, so the benefit to Disney is not so much that they are exempt from taxes or anything like that. It's that they have a nominally friendly jurisdiction for things that would otherwise be regulated by a county or municipal government. So things like uh, fire protection, police services, um, zoning decisions, the um, elevator inspections, you know, all those sort of very nitty gritty rubber hits the road sort of things. And, you know, Disney benefits from that, not so much financially, but in terms of its control, right? Disney, Walt Disney, um, you know, going back to Walt Disney, right, are very much control freaks about the experience of going to Disney World, right? The whole idea is, you know, he, you know Walt wanted a control to be able to essentially present his vision of what the theme park ought to be so it wouldn't be trashy, right? He didn't want it to be sort of a, you know, Atlanta City boardwalk. He wanted it to be, you know, this very classy sort of uh, thing, which Disney has more or less succeeded in doing. Um, having said that, um, you know, other theme parks have survived without having these sort of uh, controls. You know, Universal, with some foots and starts, um, you know, has has built itself up to be a worthy competitor, right, without having a universal improvement district um, of their own, right? They're under the Orange County and, you know, Orlando governments and uh, don't have to have their own elevator inspectors to be able to run their business. So, um, so, um, so that's the b- backstory. So, um, so Ron DeSantis got into this thing with Disney, eventually, um, you know, he convinced the legislature to take away this special district control. Originally, the plan was just abolish the district. Then they figured out this would actually dump a bunch of debt on the taxpayers. Um, And so they said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. Instead, we're going to take control of the district. Um, And so now the governor gets to appoint the members of the district board. And, you know, um, as far as the practical impact of this, if you are a firefighter that works for the Reedy Creek Improvement District, this might impact your life. Um, if you are trying to get permission to change an off-ramp on the Disney property, if you're a Disney Corporation transportation engineer, this might change your life. Um, for the average human being in Florida, uh, this is uh, probably not uh, going to change anybody's life. Um, so, um and it probably isn't going to affect their taxes in any meaningful way. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm sure the they they are levied a property tax by the improvement district for the services they provide. Now that will be a bit more arm's length, perhaps. Um, but you know, an improvement district can't really tax you for things it's not doing. So um, there has been talk about esta- disestablishing the two municipalities within Disney's property. But again, what that would really impact, I don't know. It might have to do with the arcania of like liquor licenses and things like that. I don't know. But um, so there are two cities base base something and um, uh, Lake Buena Vista. They might go away. But again, what 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 that actually would entail Unless you're a Disney employee, probably, and a senior Disney employee at that, it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so that's the Disney answer, uh, very um, briefly, um, or very long-windedly, I guess. Um, I've now bored everybody to death here. Um, let's see. Um, we did have a, uh, where was the question I was going to try to answer? Uh, Oh, there, uh, there was another question about the national debt. Um, you know, the, this you know, where our primary focus here is trying to be on state politics, and so um, we, we certainly would uh, welcome a discussion about the national debt at a, uh, a discussion of the na- of national politics, perhaps. Um, but that's not really an issue in a uh, uh, in a state politics. Um, so, um, with uh, uh, that said. Um, we're not ignoring you just so much as saying that it's just not um, relevant to the topic of this discussion um, uh, or the broader topic. But um, but if it's a if it's a topic of interest, certainly uh, 
uh, am, you know, ask a professor or something. Um, because, um, uh, you know, certainly the issue of a balanced budget and national debt has been one on the agenda for, uh, well, pretty much all of my lifetime, uh, going back to, or at least my adult lifetime, going back to Ross Perot's campaign in 1992. So it's been around. Um, let's see. Uh, so we got about 15 minutes left. Um, we could flip a coin um, and say, what are we interested in talking about more, Buckhead City or... Um, gambling. <laughs> uh, I was going to go with Georgia being a purple state. You want you want Georgia being a purple state? Okay, we I can ask that one. Um, maybe we'll come back to, to another one depending on how we're doing time wise. Uh, so um, so this is kind of a broader question about uh, Georgia politics more broadly. Um, you know, how would you characterize Georgia politics today? Uh, you know, some people would argue Georgia's still a red state. Obviously, we have most of our state, all of our statewide elected officials are Republicans. The Republicans are dominant in both the uh, chambers of the General Assembly. Um, on the other hand, we have two Democratic senators. Um, so, so are we red? Are we purple? We voted for Joe Biden. What's the deal? Great question. Sorry if I skipped over that question, Julie, if you're waiting on one. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to point out and remind us all that in the 2022 election, uh, in terms of statewide state elections, the Republican Party crushed the entire election. With the exception, I think, of a couple of Senate seats, the Republican Party dominated the state legislature. Uh, Governor Kemp won an impressive victory over an impressive opponent in Stacey Abrams. Uh, so the Republican Party is still very much here. Having said that, Democrats have a lot to be happy about. If you are a Democrat, you know that in 2020, uh, President Biden won the state of Georgia, granted by only a little over 12,000 votes, so very close, but he did win the 16 electoral votes from Georgia. And we also have two U.S. senators that are Democrats. Um, the Democratic Party has had a lot of success in recent years at the federal level. However, um, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, there's a great deal of growth in Georgia over the last couple of decades. Um, if you look at the data from, say, 2000 to about 2020, uh, there has been a shift in the population. As we grow, uh, urban counties are leaning aggressively more left. Rural counties are leaning aggressively more to the right. But that's that's kind of intuitive. That's what happens. Urban areas, Democrats do well. Rural areas, Republicans do well. But in the last 20 years, the Democratic counties in the state of Georgia that have increase their support for excuse me, the urban counties that have increased their support for Democrats have increased their populations by almost 8 million people. Rural counties have increased their populations by about 3 million people. So there are more Democrats in the state. Uh, there's a an extraordinary influx of people coming to the state of Georgia. A lot of the minorities generally supportive of the Democratic Party. Um, so there's a lot of good things if you're a Democrat, a lot of good things if you're a Republican. However, there's also some things that would I don't want to depress any Democratic voters out there. But when you look at the impressive victories of, say, Senator uh, Raphael Warnock, uh, it's impressive in that from 2020 to 2022, he didn't win his Senate seat once or twice. He won three times in 2022. He literally won, though not with a majority, the general election and then won a close uh, runoff. So in just over two years of serving in the Senate, Senator Warnock has won three times. However, there are a few variables at play that might be somewhat unique. Um, I pride myself and make myself remain incredibly neutral in class or whenever I represent the university, and I'm going to continue to do so, but I'm going to have to say something that's a little tricky. In the 22 election, the Republican Party for the U.S. Senate put up a Herschel Walker. By any metrics, by any standards that you can possibly imagine, Herschel Walker was a flawed candidate. He was a weak candidate. There is no way around that. Uh, there were a number of accusations uh, related to domestic violence, not to mention at public speeches. I don't know of a single public speech that Herschel Walker took part in that did not result in some kind of catastrophe. So again, Republicans would be the first to tell you this. Republican, uh, the RNC uh, was quite vocal uh, at times about how they were a little worried about Walker's candidacy. What I'm getting at is this. Um, 
As impressive as the victory was, uh, Senator Raphael Warnock raised an in unimaginable $175 million for 2022 election. Herschel Walker didn't have half of that to spend. Also, as we said, Herschel Walker is something of a weak candidate. So when you look at the incredibly close nature of the 2022 election and runoff, there's something of a problem there, I would think, for Democrats. Um, if I were to give you a metaphor, I'm a diehard Alabama football fan. If Alabama were to play Mercer, which we have, and Mercer takes us into quadruple overtime and Alabama wins by a field goal, would Alabama fans be happy? Hopefully this uh, metaphor is making sense. Um, Raphael Warnock had twice the war chest of Herschel Walker. He was going up against what Republicans and Democrats refer to as a weak candidate, and he still barely beat him. So I don't want to harp on this. I just want to point out the fact that while the Democratic Party is having great success in Georgia, it is incredibly, incredibly close. Uh, so with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Lester, if she'd like to add anything. I would actually like to bring it back to actual state politics and the state legislature and the changing nature. Um, there's at least 83 non-white members of the House and Senate combined out of the 236, um, which is a big deal. And um, there's actually, I believe, 81 women. This is the most diverse state legislature that we've seen. And some of that is a reflection of the changing demographics um, of the state of Georgia and as we progress through the years, we'll probably continue to see um, this change in effect, um, the composition of the state legisl legislature and change the direction of Georgia politics. Good points by both of you. I, I, I do think it's important to, yeah, I think, I think to some extent, right, the, the kind of winner takes all slash runoff nature, getting back to the runoff question of, of a lot of these elections kind of masks in some ways how close things are right um you know in both directions right in the sense that you know um both parties at this point in georgia i would say i th I, I don't think anybody would find this terribly controversial um can depend on 45 percent of the vote statewide i think you know fairly so really the question is you know who is better at getting that remaining 50 or the, the remaining five percent plus one vote right um and you know sometimes it's the democrats and sometimes it's the republicans um of late it's mostly been the republicans but sometimes it's the democrats right um i mean i think the republicans in some ways have a little bit easier route to the 50 percent plus one in the sense that um, the Republican coalition in Georgia is less fragmented. It's certainly less racially divided. It's, um, I think there are probably fewer demographic divides in general within the Republican electorate. Um, and so, you know, uh, the Democrats have a challenge, I, I, a little bit more of an uphill challenge in the sense that it's just hard to keep all the different groups that want uh, the Democrats to succeed, um, to keep them all on the train to um, make them actually make it succeed, I guess is probably the best way I, I can put it politely. Um, you know, I, I think um, I observed, uh, the, you know, not too long ago that this was the the fundamental problem, you know, Democrats face is that um, you, know, you have essentially, you know, kind of a, 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 without not to put too fine a point on it, but you have an African American faction that sees itself as the the driving force behind the party, is, sees itself as the demographic base of the party, sees itself as you know the rightful leaders of the party, um, and then you also have the um, smaller perhaps faction of uh, of white and non black uh, to some extent uh, politicians um, who um, would also point out that that's great but georgia is not a 50 percent black state right you need to have one, uh, at least some white voters some non-black voters to vote for the democrats or otherwise you know democrats are not going to win elections and um and there is no real way to make both groups happy simultaneously most of the time right um you know you you have the kind of the goldilocks situation of um, you know, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff running in uh, 2020, but that's, you know, a once in a blue moon situation where you have two 
equivalent offices on the ballot at the same time, right? Um, that doesn't come up, right? Somebody has to play second fiddle when it comes to state politics, right? You know, the, the if the governor's black, the governor can also be white, right? The governor, <laughs> the lieutenant governor's white, the lieutenant governor can also be black, right? Um, at least, you know, uh, from a demographic point of view, perhaps. Um, and so try to figure out how, how you navigate that. Keeping all those factions happy, I think, is always a, is becoming, has been the challenge for the Democrats. Now, maybe the demographic changes in Georgia will be enough that five, ten years down the road, um, you know, that those compromises are going to be less explicit, or maybe people will care less about, you know, what uh, my group getting my fair desserts or whatever, but um, but that would be kind of my um, off the cuff observation there that probably is going to get me in trouble with somebody. Um, but in any event, um, uh, let's see. Um, so uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, getting back to state politics, I think we'll ask the uh, since uh, John got his preference, uh, we'll. Uh, we'll talk about um, uh, Buckhead City um, and uh, municipal government more generally. Um, so one of the recurring things for this se session was actually something that came back from last year was the, this idea of splitting off the northern part of Atlanta into a separate municipality that would be, uh, speaking of race, uh, predominantly white, um, predominantly wealthy. Uh, we've deprived Atlanta of something like I want to say like 40% of its property tax base, if I'm not mistaken, um, although certainly not anywhere near 40% of its population, um, would have had an average household wealth of over a hundred or something like 130, average family income of something like $130,000 as opposed to the rest of Atlanta, which would have been, you know, something like a third of that. Um, so clearly a huge demographic difference between Buckhead, the city, the other city, not the other Buckhead, because there's a second Buckhead, just to confuse things. Um, so what happened to Buckhead City? Why isn't Buckhead City a thing? Will it ever be a thing? Um, you got five minutes, go at it. <laughs> so yeah, it's actually the city of Buckhead City would be the Atlanta. Um, spoiler alert, it's not going to be a thing this year. Um, there's actually a really long history, but kind of more recent history is 2020, whenever you had the protest in Atlanta over the deaths of George Floyd and Rayshard Brooks. Uh, people in Buckhead were not happy with how the former mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, handled um, those protests and handled Brooks' death, uh, as well as other concerns about service delivery in Buckhead. So that kind of helped galvanize the most recent movement. Now, I think it's important for us to know what actually makes a cityhood movement. Um, there's a few things that's actually necessary. You have to have, the most important thing is you have to have a legislator that will introduce the bill in the General Assembly. And for this most recent legislation, you had nine senators who did that. Nine senators that did not live in the proposed city of Buckhead City. So he had nine Republican senators. The three senators that have areas that uh, represent areas of Buckhead in Atlanta actually are all three Democrats. And well, I'll get back to that. Uh, you also have to have a 501c3, and the 501c3 uh, was originally called the Buckhead Exploratory Committee, and then it changed to uh, Buckhead City Committee. You have to have a feasibility studied. Uh, completed by a state-approved Georgia academic institution. Valdosta State actually did this one. And then you have to have a city plan to provide three of 11 services that municipalities are allowed to provide uh, via state law, such as fire protection, utility service, police protection, those types of things. So the city of Buckhead City movement actually had all of those things. Um, so they had the legislators. Now, last year, when they were trying to push this legislation through, a uh, former speaker who was now passed away, Ralston and former Lieutenant Governor Duncan's like, no, we're not going to do this. Well, both of those people are gone. So you've got two new players here and you have two new players that were actually support uh, in support of this. Um, this bill. Um, so there were actually two bills. There was Senate Bill 113, which dealt with some of the general issues related to munis municipalities and de-annexation, and Senate Bill 114, which was the actual Buckhead City Movement Bill. Um, their arguments 
were public safety, going back to the riots and, and other issues. Zoning, they were concerned about proposals to decrease lot size for affordable housing. As Dr. Lawrence already mentioned, the taxes, they felt like they weren't getting their fair share of return on their tax dollars that went into Atlanta uh, infrastructure. And this I find very interesting. If you watched any of the floor debate on this issue in the Senate, it was about people should have the right to vote. We do not want to disenfranchise voters. You had Republican senators on the floor of the Georgia State Senate making that case about this piece of legislation and their Democratic colleagues actually challenged them and they said, one of them actually said, well, you sound a lot like a Democrat today, sir. So it was kind of an interesting watching the floor debate and how they framed this issue. Um, the arguments against cityhood was it's going to weaken the Atlanta metro area. A lot of the corporations that are headquartered or have offices in Atlanta said that um, this is a startup city. There's going to be financial risk with the startup city. Um, it's not easy just to start a city. Uh, Governor Kemp's office also issued a memo questioning the constitutionality of the action. I believe there were 11 points tying it to government finance, bonds, um, and then also the school, like what's going to happen with these children because they can't go to APS. Can Fulton County Schools handle it uh, because you can't just create a new school system. Um, there's some constitutionality issues with that. And then the big issue for everybody, no matter where you live in the state of Georgia, is the precedent that this would set for other municipalities and de-annexation. Um, it is absolutely unprecedented to carve a city out of an existing municipality. Traditionally, new cities are formed from unincorporated areas and counties. Um, the newest city will be Mableton, and it was formed out of unincorporated Cobb. So if Buckhead City was allowed to be created, it would kind of flip that process. So that's kind of how it affects all of us. Um, like I mentioned earlier, with the spoiler alert, it, it 114 did not go anywhere. And then, of course, uh, 113 was uh, tabled. And the leader of the Buckhead City movement, he tweeted, which apparently the tweet is now deleted, Bill White, he actually said that he didn't see a path forward with the city of Buckhead City while Governor Kemp was in office. So wait until 2026. Whether or not that's the case, I don't know, but that's kind of what the leader of the movement said. Uh, Dr. Hall, anything to add? I see we are now over time. I'm just shocked that, did you say 40% of the property tax for Atlanta comes from Buckhead? I think that might have been an underestimate. It was like 40 or 45%, wasn't it? Something like that. So I can't remember exactly the amazing. number. Of it. Wow. I saw 40% of what I saw. Yeah. That's incredible. Okay. Well, uh, on that note, we have run over time. So I want to uh, take care of some housekeeping and uh, a couple things first. Uh, well, of course, thank our uh, panelists for uh, uh, joining us, Dr. John Hall and Dr. Julie Lester, as well as uh, our uh, audience members and all your great questions. Sorry, we didn't get to everything that um, you know we're uh, asking about. Um, for those of you that are interested in uh, LGBTQ issues, uh, we do have a event coming up in about five weeks. Um, on the front lines, a plaintiff in the fight for marriage equality. Um, a discussion with Don Diaz Johnston, uh, who was one of the plaintiffs in uh, the uh, marriage equality case in Florida uh, from, I believe it was 2014. I don't have the number in front of me exactly, but I think it was 2014. Uh, he will be coming to speak uh, to uh, students and uh, interested community members on um, uh, Thursday, April 13th at 2 p.m. in uh, room 231 of the Teacher Education Building on the Making Campus. Um, we also plan to, um, uh, I believe we've secured permission, I'll double check this with uh, um, uh, Dr. Decker, but I believe we have secured permission for a live stream of that event um, So from the, from the speaker, so I will uh, we'll be making the arrangements to get that on our uh, YouTube page uh, as a live stream um, uh, then. Um, speaking of our YouTube page uh, at uh, youtube.com slash at MGA Paul Sai. Uh, that's where you'll find archived videos of our past discussion events and an archived video of this discussion event will be posted there um, hopefully sometime tomorrow. Um, takes a little while for the video to download and get processed and that sort of thing. Um, we also have a, a Women's History Month event on the uh, uh, 
Warner Robins campus um, that uh, will be held with in conjunction with uh, Dr. Uh, or Professor uh, Adam Square's uh, Professors on Diversities class uh, next Thursday at 12.15 in Oak Hall in room 215. Um, she has a student veteran, uh, female student veteran in her class who will be speaking to uh, the Perspectives on Diversity class. And again, that's open to students who are interested in uh, joining that. And there's information on that event as well as uh, the um, uh, LGBT, uh, the uh, marriage equality event on our um, uh, department YouTube page uh, or and department uh, Facebook page. And uh, we're on Facebook at, yeah, it's uh, facebook.com slash mjpaulsci. We're also on uh, Twitter and now on LinkedIn as well. So we're all we're all over social media, except we will not be doing viral TikToks. So I've drawn the line at that. Um, plus, I think it's illegal for me to do that anyway as a state employee. So at least on state property. Um, will these events be live streamed? So um, I don't believe um, Professor Adam Square's event will have a live stream, um, but uh, we are going to... Um, we we'll try to do a, a live stream for the marriage equality event again. Um, uh, this is our first, uh, this will be our first attempt at a true live stream. Um, so because, um, you know, Teams is not really set up for live streams, so um, it's not quite the same thing. So I'm told it's fairly easy to do. Um, I will be practicing. Um, I have the equipment I think we need to make it work. Um, so it's just a matter of making it work. Um, maybe with support from OTR, we'll see. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody again. I've been uh, blabbering way too long. Um, uh, and uh, have a, a good um, uh, weekend. Um, and uh, see you all uh, at a future event, hopefully. And thanks again to our panelists. And uh, good evening. And I will... Uh, Stop our recording.